So pembrolizumab is an anti-PD-1 antibody. And what it uh, does, it uh, actually breaks up the defense mechanisms uh, at tumor sites to neutralize the function of T lymphocytes. So here on this uh, diagram, you see a tumor cell, you see a myeloid cell, APC, and you see the T cell, green. And the T cell uh, expresses a PD-1 on its surface. And the tumor cells, by defense mechanism, uh, express uh, or can express PDL1. And that interaction between PDL1 and PD1 neutralizes the functionality of T cells, so they can now no further kill tumor cells. They can be downregulated in a similar manner by other cells in the tumor infiltrate. And the myeloid cells are known to also express or be capable to express PDL1 and thereby neutralize the function of T cells at tumor sites. So if you avoid this interaction with the anti-PD-1 antibody, and we have two main ones, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, then the T cells can conduct their function and kill tumor cells. So we had an old era of uh, adjuvant therapies for uh, stage uh, three melanoma, and this was with a marginally active agent, interferon alpha. And so over the course of time of 15 years, uh, three uh, types of regimens of uh, interferon were approved by the FDA, but all basically, whether it was high dose, low dose, or pegylated interferon, with very marginal impact on uh, uh, melanoma outcome in uh, stage three. Now we have the new era, and within a very short time, in the years 2015 through 2018, we see that the new drugs, one by one, uh, also that have established their activity in advanced melanoma, uh, also have been shown to be significantly impacting in the adjuvant setting uh, stage three melanoma. Whether it's ipilimumab, approved by the FDA in 2015 in a prior EORTC trial, showing its superiority over placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.75. That means 25% risk reduction for relapse or death. Nivolumab was randomized against ipilimumab and was shown to be superior to ipilimumab and was approved in December 2017. Then the combination of the brafenib and trametinib, which are BRAF and MEK inhibitors, um, um, showed superiority over placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.47. And if it was not approved yesterday, it will be approved tomorrow. It's there in the process of uh, getting this approval. And then I will be reporting on the adjuvant trial with pembrolizumab, therefore the other anti-PD-1 uh, antibody. And uh, we will show that in our trial, the hazard ratio is 0.57. And we will file, uh, or we, Merck will file in 2018, and this is expected to result also in uh, approval. So when you look at stage three melanoma, what are the relapse rates? How high is the risk for relapse? If you have stage 3A, it's 37% uh, at five years. For stage 3B, 68%, and for stage C, basically 90% relapses at five years. So this is the, uh, the crucial slide uh, showing the uh, design of the trial. 1,019 patients with regionally lymph node positive melanoma are randomized between receiving pembrolizumab, 200 milligrams uh, flat dose every three weeks for one year, or placebo. Now at relapse, and this is the unique aspect of this trial, patients are unblinded. And if they were in the placebo arm, then they are guaranteed to have access to crossover and have access for free to the clinical trial drug pembrolizumab. And, what that, and then they can receive that pembrolizumab for, up to, ten, for uh, up to two years. So what that means is that there is a first question, which is a simple one. What will be the impact of adjuvant pembrolizumab for recurrence-free survival? But the second question is, with this active drug, could we actually not simply treat those who need it at relapse immediately and would potentially have the same outcome, yes or no. And so this is the only trial in the history of adjuvant trials in melanoma, or actually any adjuvant trial, 
uh, that addresses this second question, which is of elementary importance. And I thank uh, Eric Rubin of Merck to have stuck to this proposal and push it forward. So the key eligibility criteria are that you have stage three, it's in the middle, and if you have only one positive sentinel node, the tumor load in the sentinel node must be bigger than one millimeter in diameter. Why? Because that's the bottom curve that you see in the figure. And then you have a five-year survival rate of about 60%. If you have a smaller tumor load, the number of events will drop very significantly, and this patient population is not at high enough risk to be included in these kind of trials to provide answers. So the outcome. Primary endpoint is recurrence-free survival in the overall patient population. And so what you see is that blue is pembrolizumab, red is placebo, and the hazard ratio is 0.57. So it's a 43% risk reduction. In absolute terms, which is what usually understood uh, better, this means that at uh, 12 months, there is an absolute difference in uh, terms of relapse-free uh, survival of 14.5%, uh, and at 18 months of 18.2%. Uh, also, note that the curves are diverging, so it seems to get better over time, and that is because the responses to immunotherapy are long-lasting responses. The other patient population that was a primary, co-primary endpoint population are the ones you see on the left with PD-L1 positive tumors, has a trace of 0.54. The ones with PD-L1 negative tumors seem to be doing just as well or even better in terms of hazard ratio, but there is a caveat here. There are few patients in that graph because only 11% of the patient population was PD-L1 negative. So in the end, I think it's not going to make any difference. By sub-stage of uh, stage three patients, stage 3A has a hazard ratio of 0.33, uh, 0.32, and the more advanced stages have hazard ratios that are basically identical, 0.56 and 0.58. And what you see at 18 months is an absolute difference of 20% benefit for the pembrolizumab populations. There was no difference between whether patients were BRAF mutated or uh, uh, BRAF wild type. And here in the forest plot, you see similar impact for all predefined patient populations. This is an important slide. It shows that, that time to distant metastases is twice as short for placebo patients than it is for pembrolizumab patients. And so this is the first indication that distant metastasis-free survival with this hazard ratio will, when the data are mature, will be similarly good or potentially even better than the relapse-free survival rates. The last item is always, what is the toxicity? Now, the anti-PD-1 antibodies have an extremely favorable um, side effect profile. And so an incredible therapeutic index in terms of high efficacy and very low toxicity. When we look at grade three, four immune-related events, you must realize that 0.2% is one patient. And so we have only three patients with grade three toxicities in skin. We have one patient with a very weird phenomenon of myositis who eventually died of this disease, but this is the only case in thousands of patients who received pembrolizumab outside this trial, and so we are still puzzled by this case. Only one case of pancreatitis, 10 patients with a colitis, uh, four patients with pneumonitis, one patient with myocarditis, seven patients with hepatitis, and then uh, two patients with nephritis, and then you see endocrine uh, uh, disorders. Well, most of them are thyroiditis and hypothyroidism that is very easily treated with thyroxin. And so there was only one patient with a grade three event. The other events are hypophysitis, but only in 3% of three patients, I should say, diabetes in five and adrenal in one. And so when you look at the total of grade three events, it's only 39 patients out of 514 patients randomized. And so it's convincingly demonstrated that adjuvant pembrolizumab does have a very significant impact on relapse-free survival, both in the overall patient population and in the pdl one positive patient population. It's true across all subgroups and a very favorable safety profile. 
The study will remain blinded in terms of distant metastasis free and overall survival. That will, the distant metastasis free survival will be like relapse free survival. The overall survival will be in two to three years and will give an answer to that question. Is it better to give everybody upfront adjuvant therapy or can we suffice to give those who relapse actually treatment? And so that will be the most original answer in the history of adjuvant therapy trials. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.